There were two Birmingham policemen, sort of burly uh, white guys. One had his hand on the scruff of Dr. King's collar, and the other had his hand around the belt loop on the back, and they were shoving him roughly up the sidewalk. And I would not say they were being brutal, but they certainly were being rough, and they certainly were being disrespectful. And it was quite startling. And as they continued to shove him toward a paddy wagon, and I would later learn that this was the arrest that led to him writing the letter from a Birmingham jail, one of the iconic documents of the Civil Rights Movement. As they pushed him up the sidewalk uh, in the direction of the paddy wagon, they passed probably three feet from where I was. And I found myself looking into the face of Martin Luther King. And I don't know what I expected to see on his face in that moment. It's possible that I might have expected to see anger. I think I would have been angry if I'd been in his place and was being treated the way he was in that exact moment. Or maybe I expected to see some degree of fear. It frightened me a little bit as a kid watching this unfold, knowing that it could escalate, not knowing what would happen next. But what I thought I saw instead in these large, dark, expressive eyes that Dr. King had uh, was this sort of deep well of sadness. Um, I don't know, of course, what he was thinking in that exact moment, but my teenage brain took a picture of that moment, and the face of history that was unfolding around us became the face of Martin Luther King for me. I would love to say that I immediately knew what to make of this, that I immediately understood the magnitude of racial injustice in our place, and that I immediately resolved to be part of the solution. None of that would be quite true. But I was deeply unsettled, deeply disturbed by this image that was like it was seared into my brain, and later, when I saw photographs of the actual moment that I was remembering, I was struck by how remarkably accurate the memory was. Such was the impact of seeing that in that time and place. And what I felt from then on was that something was really bad wrong and that I needed to understand it. And so for me, the 1960s became a time of trying to figure out that issue and others that were shaping uh, the country uh, and that people were trying to address in ways where, as some of us put it at the time, a great country could become even greater. I think that was one of the things that we felt uh, as, the, uh, as the decade was beginning to unfold. I got to Vanderbilt in the fall of 1964 as a freshman. The, um, first class of African-American undergraduates arrived at Vanderbilt that same year. They had had black graduate students before then, uh, including James Lawson, who had been one of the nonviolent architects of the Civil Rights Movement. Um, but they had not had African-American undergraduates. And as you might imagine, at a Southern University with Ivy League pretensions, the this first class of black undergraduates contained some remarkable young men and women. And I was fortunate that I lived on, the, in, on a dorm floor in Cole Hall with several of them. I remember one uh, was a guy who was majoring in math, which was in and of itself mysterious to me. He tutored me in calculus, and he was so effective that I was able to make a D. And I was, I was very happy about this because at, the, at midterm, my grade had been like 37, with, with 60 being passing. I had, no, not only did I not know how to do calculus, I couldn't figure out what it was. And so it was a, uh, it was a tough semester mathematically, but the, the guy down the hall uh, who was majoring in this stuff uh, and who was African-American actually was kind enough to nurse me through so that I got close enough to a D to where all I had to do was go to the professor and say, if you'll just pass me, you won't have to teach me again. And he thought <laughs> that was sufficient inducement and he, um, it's a true story and unembellished. It was, uh, but in addition to um, 
these academic feats uh, that I saw from classmates uh, who were African-American, there were a lot of serious conversations about the issue of race. And we talked about uh, what inequality meant in America. Uh, and I became more and more involved in that issue and with it, uh, with other issues that began to unfold as the decade uh, went along. I learned later about uh, some young men who I write about in the, on the first page of the first chapter of the book. Four young college freshmen at North Carolina A&T University in Greensboro. Uh, four African American uh, men who were the second or third generations in their families to go to college. It happened that they were all science majors. Um, one of them later became a general in Vietnam. They were highly motivated young men. And on the night of January 31st, they were having a dormitory bull session, as college freshmen will sometimes do. And they started talking about the issue of civil rights, the issue of racial injustice in America. And they talked in particular about the insult of segregation, the insult of white-only signs that they saw at water fountains and lunch counters and bathrooms in public places wherever they went or the necessity of riding in the back of the bus. And that's the way it, that's the way they understood these symbols of Southern segregation and Southern law as insults that told them every day of their lives that they were intended to be less than, and they knew they weren't. And so they started talking about this. And the first thing they did, they remembered later and explained to me and a series of wonderful conversations that we had about what happened on the following day. They started talking about this on the night of January 31st, and as young people sometimes do, they blame their parents. Uh, they started talking about how their parents' generation should have figured out a way to fight back so that this would not be a reality that circumscribed their own lives as they were young men seeking to make their way in America. And as they railed against their parents, and the evening grew late, uh, and uh, they, somewhere on the morning side of midnight, they began to say to each other, but wait a minute, what have we done? The four of us right here in this room, what have we done? And Franklin McCain, who later became a chemist in Charlotte, North Carolina, looked at the others and he said, I feel dirty, I feel ashamed. Because their answer was, they had done nothing. And so Joe McNeil, who became the general, looked at the others and he said, let's do something. And so the next day they did. They went down without any further advanced planning after they had been to all of their classes. Uh, Franklin McCain still in his ROTC uniform. They went down to the Woolworth store in downtown Greensboro and they took their seats on the white people's, at the white people's lunch counter on these padded swivel stools beneath signs promoting lemon pie. And they insisted on being served. And that day, the Woolworths management shut down the lunch counter rather than serve them. But the next day, they were back, and the next, and the next, and more and more of their friends came. And within two weeks, uh, in communities all over the South, including Montgomery, there were similar protests by similar African-American groups of students uh, and some of their white friends uh, trickled in uh, as time went by. In Nashville, Tennessee, up the road, um, probably the most organized of all of the sit-ins, James Lawson was still in Nashville and he had been conducting nonviolent workshops for the students who uh, performed the sit-in demonstrations there. They had been planning to do this before the Greensboro Four did what they did spontaneously, uh, but the Nashville kids immediately jumped into the fray, and probably more than anywhere else, they understood not only the philosophical anchors of nonviolent activism, but also the theological anchors of it. Because James Lawson had said to them, we are going to prove to America that the power of love is more powerful than the power of hate. And that's an amazing leap of faith, isn't it? It's an amazing affirmation. I'm not even sure I believe it, but they did.
and they acted on it in a way that suggested to the rest of us uh, that some important and powerful possibilities now uh, stood before us as a nation and we could become more just and more inclusive. There was pushback even at the time, some violence, uh, some scuffles, um, and we thought this could get even more tense before it's all over. And, um, and so as we pondered what the possibilities might be and uh, whether we could get through the tension that, that, uh, that was building, other voices began to join those of the activists. Uh, there were uh, musicians and folk musicians and others who sang songs of protest uh, and lifted their voices in these great anthems about uh, human brotherhood and those kinds of things. And there were writers, too, who wrote uh, very powerfully about this issue. A journalist named John Howard Griffin, white guy, decided to darken his skin and shave his head so that, uh, uh, so that you couldn't tell from his hair that he had been white and to try to pass as a black person. Uh, and he wrote a book about it called Black Like Me after first writing a series of articles about it in the African-American magazine Sepia. Um, John Howard Griffin's book Black Like Me stirred a great deal of controversy uh, among people of both races, really, uh, among whites because he made it clear that his life changed in a dramatic and excruciating way simply by virtue of a change in the color of his skin. So excruciating, in fact, that he could only stand to be black for five weeks and then he ended his experiment. It was that painful to him to try to make that transition. And there were some African Americans, I think, who thought, well, yeah, no kidding, you know, it's, uh, uh, you, did, you weren't as tough as you thought or whatever. But it was an amazing thing that John Howard Griffin did, and some of us who were trying to figure these things out read that book and were startled by it and, again, jolted by it uh, even more. Um, there was another book that came out um, in 1960, as Griffin's book did, and I'm going to read just a short excerpt from my book about this second book that began to address this issue, and I think it'll be familiar to you. As the accolades came and controversy swir swirled around John Howard Griffin, Harper Lee waited impatiently for the publication of her novel. She had no idea, of course, that To Kill a Mockingbird would become one of the most beloved and best-selling books of all time, but she did know that she had worked hard on it. As a writer, she was sure of her voice, her ability to tell the story through the eyes of Scout Finch, an eight-year-old girl. Girl, it was a remarkable double narrator effect, the innocence of a child, the whispered wisdom of a woman looking back, but the shape and structure of the novel gave her fits, and Harper Lee spent more time than she cared to remember, holed up by herself in a cold water flat in New York City, fighting the pages, trying desperately to make the pieces fit. Once, in a fit of frustration, she threw the manuscript out the window and watched it blow through the Manhattan snow. Fortunately, she was able to gather herself and hurry outside, retrieving the pages before it was too late. The story she knew she had to tell was one that had long been swirling in her mind. It began with the image of an Alabama town, a place she thought that others might like, even if they knew its dark underside. In the 1930s, she had been a child in such a place when racial injustice was a hard-edged thing filled with lynchings and black men punished for things they never did. And only the strongest, most honorable white people were able to muster the strength to oppose it. In the character of Atticus Finch, her iconic and archetypal, archetypal protagonist, Harper Lee created for millions who bought her book a lonely white southerner who was worthy of respect. In this, her timing could not have been better. When her novel was published on July 11th, 1960, the sit-in movement and the backlash against it were sweeping through the South, and many people feared, quite correctly, that the unleashed tension would only get worse. On some level, the book itself may have added to that tension. It was, by its very existence, an act of protest, wrote Pulitzer Prize-winning 
historian Diane McWhorter. An injustice against an innocent black man lay at its heart, a message many Southerners did not want to hear. But so many of us were drawn to the other side of the story. For here was Atticus Finch, a small town lawyer willing to stand for what he knew was right. He defended Tom Robinson, a black man falsely accused of rape. And though he ultimately failed in that defense, his eloquence and calm amid all the ugly tensions of his time offered real life hope for ours. America, uh, Atticus was not an unfamiliar character. Many of us knew somebody like him, or people at least who bore some re resemblance. And as America struggled with its original sin, this figure from the pages of a splendid novel helped us believe we might make it through. Now, as time has gone by, people have debated the character of Atticus Finch and in the, um, <clears throat> the current play on Broadway of To Kill a Mockingbird, Aaron Sorkin sort of updates Atticus a little bit for our times and I think all that's fair enough. We continue to um, define the meaning of, uh, of iconic works of literature as time goes by, but in its time, in 1960, uh, what you had offered to the country by Harper Lee was a portrait of decency uh, at a time that we had to believe in it if we were going to make progress in the country. The idealism of all of that, I think, began to spread from the issue of race to other issues. In 1962, another woman author uh, made quite a splash in the country on a couple of different levels, as it turned out. Rachel Carson wrote a book called Silent Spring. Rachel Carson was a young scientist who had grown up in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. She came from a poor family. They lived near a glue factory where the stench was awful and she saw the dark underside of the Industrial Revolution uh, as uh, they made glue from the bodies of horses in this factory and uh, spewed toxins into the air and into the waters around there. And yet sometimes she would go for hikes by herself on the Allegheny River and she would see the birds and the fish and the flowers and the trees and she would ponder the miracle of nature and the natural world and it seemed to her instinctively that we had to live with that world and take care of it not try to be the master of it and that kind of understanding animated her writings and in 1962 when she wrote Silent Spring she wrote about the chemical industry in America the overuse of pesticides that she thought were both a health and an environmental uh, problem for the country. And the interesting thing was that as the chemical industry responded to her charges and her indictment, their response was not so much against her scientific conclusions, although there was some of that, but it was against her right to even offer her opinion about these things because, don't you know, she was a girl. She was a woman. And science was male. Scientists were women at that time, and there was one spokesman for the chemical industry who had been the uh, U.S. Secretary of Agriculture in a previous administration, and he speculated about why it was, he wondered, that Rachel Carson, who was an attractive woman, he thought, was unmarried. What could be, what could possibly be the reason for this? And his answer that he gave in his public speculation was that she was probably a communist. That was the level of debate that, that greeted Silent Spring by this very fine writer, Rachel Carson, when the book came out. The interesting thing was that it made the book uh, important on two levels. First was the obvious uh, level of environmentalism, but the other was the level of feminism. For here was a woman uh, entering the realm of men to say something that she thought very much needed saying. It turned out that President Kennedy read the book and liked it, and he let it be known that her first book, The Sea Around Us, occupied a place of honor on his bookshelf next to the writings of Henry David Thoreau and he also appointed a commission to study her findings and the commission as historian Douglas Brinkley later wrote uh, 
basically released a report saying Rachel Carson was right. Rachel Carson, soon after her book came out, died of metastasizing breast cancer uh, caused by perhaps some of the toxins that she was writing about. She never knew, but that was her own best guess. And so an environmental consciousness and a feminine consciousness began to take their places in the country beside the racial awareness that was also growing uh, in America in those days. In 1963, Betty Friedan wrote a book called The Feminine Mystique, talking about the unfulfilled lives that many women were leading uh, in the country. Um, in August of 1963, Martin Luther King gazed out over a crowd of 250,000 people on a very temperate summer day in Washington, D.C., um, and he talked about how he had a dream. Now, the I Have a Dream speech, if you've ever watched the whole thing, was pretty tough in a lot of places and talked about how uh, if we were going to have peace and tranquility in America, we had to have racial justice in order for that to happen. But he also held out the olive branch to the country and said uh, that we really are all children of God and we can sit down together at the table of brotherhood and that this was the dream that he had for the country. And so the idealism continued to grow and continued to be a defining factor. And yet there was another side that we began to see uh, in those same days. Um, in September of 1963, a bomb exploded at 16th Street Church in Birmingham. Four young girls were killed. They were primping in the restroom for the big people's service, which they were going to be a part of. Uh, after being in a Sunday school class, the title of which was The Love That Forgives. And the bomb exploded and the wall fell in upon them. And the minister of the church, John Cross, was crawling through the rubble, uh, looking to see, hoping against hope that he would not find what he did find. There was a man named M.W. Pippin who was going through the rubble beside him. And Mr. Pippin came to a patent leather shoe and he said, that's Denise's shoe. And he was talking about Denise McNair, his granddaughter, who in fact was one of the children who died in that blast. They came to the tangle of bodies and outside uh, there was an eruption of rage and Birmingham descended into riot for a while. And two other children were killed during the course of those riots, two other black children. Um, and so it was a horrible time. Two months later, President Kennedy was killed. Uh, President Lyndon Johnson took over and by many accounts uh, did a good job in that tragic transition for the country. Um, seemed to be a steady hand on the tiller and uh, talked about the great things that still remained undone and the civil rights legislation and the voting rights legislation and the health care legislation that he intended to get through and a war on poverty that he intended to launch. And so we had the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and uh, Medicare passed the Congress and um, we declared our intention to, if not eradicate poverty, at least reduce the scope of it in the most wealthy nation on the planet. All of that was what Lyndon Johnson wanted to be his legacy for the nation. He wanted to be remembered as the president who actually delivered what John Kennedy promised. Um, there may have been some vanity in that hope that that would be his legacy, but there was also an idealism and a belief in the rightness of those kind of things that also uh, defined who Lyndon Johnson was as a man and a politician. And yet at the same time, uh, there was something else on the horizon that Lyndon Johnson felt like he had to deal with, and that was the civil war that was raging half a world away in Vietnam. Lyndon Johnson was a product not only of the New Deal era, which had shaped his view of the possibilities of government and what it could do for the country, but he was also a product of the Cold War and the sense of the world as facing a binary choice between the free world and the communist world. And in Vietnam, he knew that Ho Chi Minh, the leader of North Vietnam, was avowedly a communist. What he didn't know or didn't focus on as much as that was that when Ho Chi Minh 
had declared the independence of Vietnam, he had quoted extensively from the U.S. Declaration of Independence. And the, the agents who worked for the forerunner of the CIA had tried to tell the political leaders back in Washington that they thought Ho Chi Minh could be an ally because they had worked with him during World War II and he had helped them find, locate uh, American prisoners of war who were being held by the Japanese in parts of Southeast Asia. So this very complicated picture was reduced to something more simple by the policy makers in Washington, um, and Vietnam became a great tragedy for this country, at least that's how I present it in the book. Um, not so much commenting on the morality of it, uh, or even the strategic uh, difficulties that it presented, though there were some issues related to both, but just the tragedy that these two leaders, so important in the world, Lyndon Johnson and Ho Chi Minh, were like ships in the night never finding a way to talk to each other. And so the death toll uh, and the suffering that the Vietnam War caused were horrific uh, in both Vietnam and in this country. In Vietnam, where a million people died, in this country where we lost over 50,000 soldiers, but where we also lost a big piece of our innocence, a big piece of our belief in the things that the, our government told us and where divisions grew deeper and more cynical and more harsh um, as, the, uh, as the decade progressed. And to some extent, I think we've never quite gotten over that. All of this became quite personal for me, and I write about this in the book too. Um, I had reached the conclusion that the war uh, was not a good idea. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to be shot at or shoot at anybody because of a policy that I didn't agree with. But I had some friends who went. Uh, one of them was a young man at Vanderbilt who believed in the war and decided to give up his college deferment and join the Marines, and he went to Vietnam. And within his first year there, he was shot through the spine and paralyzed from the waist down. And he came back, and he came back to Nashville, and some of us went out to see him. And it was one of the most difficult conversations that I've ever been part of. This was a guy that I liked and admired very much. And we tried to talk about the patriotism that had sent him to Vietnam. And he seemed awkward in trying to talk to us about how he thought we lacked it, how he thought we didn't have that patriotic commitment to the country that had sent him and Maybe we weren't brave enough, and he may have been a right uh, to some extent about some of that. But it was hard for us to talk to him, too, about the fact that we thought that this decision he had been made and for which he was going to pay this lifelong price was a mistake, that it was in defense of, an, of a policy that was a mistake. And for me, the difficulty of that conversation became kind of a microcosm of the difference and difficulty uh, that began to fall heavily, I thought, on our country as a whole. So all of that, for me, made this, made this book a kind of personal story as well as, uh, as a story about what happened in those times. Even as the decade went on, there were voices of people who were trying to reconcile the differences, were trying to come together. I want to read, and sometimes they came from surprising places. Uh, here's another little uh, snippet from the book that also takes place in, uh, in the state of Alabama. In 1966, in this time of tension, which had been building steadily for most of the decade, there was a little oasis in northern Alabama. Nobody could quite say why it was there. Segregation and voting rights to more, the more difficult terrain of peace in Vietnam and then income inequality in America the realities of poverty in America, and it had begun to occur to him that the country was not going to respond to these economic issues that also were to him issues of justice in the way that he thought was necessary for our country to be stable and whole. And yet in the midst of his despair about these kinds of things, he went to Memphis and he offered his support and threw it behind a strike by garbage workers, most of them black, uh, 
um, for better wages and safer working conditions. And while he was in Memphis, he was shot on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel and died uh, instantly. Um, the night before, he had made his very last speech. And in that speech, even against the backdrop of his own despair, he reached deep for optimism and he talked about a promised land that he might not reach, but that the rest of us would, he said. And so that, that final um, courage, act of courage that he had to say to the rest of us that we could reach a place of peace and justice was his last uh, living gift uh, to the country. Robert Kennedy on April 4th, 1968 was on his way uh, to deliver a campaign speech in the presidential primary in Indiana. Um, it fell to him to tell a group of African Americans who had come out to hear his speech that Martin Luther King had been killed and the crowd didn't know it yet and they were horrified by the news and screamed in grief and anger and Kennedy had to talk to them off the cuff and if you've never seen that speech, look it up on YouTube. It's one of the great uh, speeches ever given in this country and probably the greatest single extemporaneous speech I've ever seen. But he ended by quoting extemporaneously from the uh, Greek philosopher uh, Aeschylus, said, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. And I guess I sort of end the book by asking whether or not we have achieved that wisdom in this country, whether we ever will achieve it, whether that idealism that propelled us through much of the 60s uh, is equal to the other streak in our character that we also uh, saw building during that time. And I end the book by asking that question and then I answer it in the most unhelpful possible way. I say, even today, I do not know. Thank you very much. I don't know how much time we have, but I'm happy to answer a few questions. If anybody has them or comments, here's a... We've got, we've got time for a few questions. I was in the other room, can you hear me? Listening, you may have already said this. Tell us about the title, A Hard Rain. I have been looking forward to your talk, but I've been puzzling over your title also. Okay, sure. Uh, the title is based on the Bob Dylan song, A Hard Rain's Gonna Fall, um, which came out very early in the decade, and I thought was a wonderfully poetic and prophetic um, um, reflection on the times that were, that were gathering and the things that we might have to face. Interesting thing about the title, um, I had been at work um, on the book for two years, uh, six days a week, um, for two years not knowing what the title was. I knew the subtitle. America in the 1960s, our decade of hope, possibility, and innocence lost. But every title that I had come up with on my own seemed cliched and stupid to me. And I struggled with this for a long time. Um, and then one day I turned on the radio and there was that song. And uh, I thought, oh, well, yeah, you know, that's... Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I couldn't think of, a, of another title from, from then on. Also, Dylan was one of the great poet laureates of the decade, and so it seemed fitting, too, to, uh, to have a title that was a play on the title of, of one of his songs. But I thought that, that song, which is a little bit enigmatic and, and uh, uh, isn't just purely political in the imagery that it offers us, uh, was a good way of suggesting to people poetically uh, what, what my approach in the book would be. So thanks for that question. Yeah, it was, uh, I just stole from Dylan, basically. So, yes. Uh, what do you think, in your words, the God of history said to George Wallace? 
George Wallace is um, is is a remarkable figure who, in the 1960s, did a lot of harm, I think, to this country. And what makes that, to me, even more tragic was that later in his life, I think he knew it. Um, his daughter, Peggy Wallace Kennedy, who I know a little bit, um, um, who um, there's this wonderful story where Peggy and her husband, Mark Kennedy, who was a justice on the Alabama Supreme Court, took their uh, then fairly small child to the Martin Luther King Center in Atlanta. And they wanted their son to know the racial history of the South. And it so happened that there was a temporary exhibit about George Wallace uh, at the King Center at that moment. Uh, and George Wallace did not come off well in this exhibit at the King Center. And their little boy said to Peggy, um, and, and sh she can tell this story more accurately, but the gist of it I'm pretty on the money with, I think. Little boy looked at her and said, Mama, why did Papa do all those awful things? And she said, he never said, but we have to make it right. Well, she, she thought that he saw, thought the same thing later in his life, after he was shot, that some, something had to be done to make it right. And so one of the things that he did was he called people like John Lewis and others in the civil rights movement and asked them to come by his office and told them he was sorry. Now, there are some people who are fairly cynical about this um, and thought that at best, as one of his white friends told me in an interview, um, George just learned to count. And what that meant was that African Americans could vote in Alabama by then, and he was still running for office from a wheelchair, and so he wanted that vote. Interestingly, though, John Lewis and others, C.T. Vivian and others I talked to, who were recipients of those apologies, thought Wallace meant it. Now, maybe that says more about them than it does about Wallace, I don't know. But on the other hand, they were pretty perceptive men, are pretty perceptive men, and so I throw that out. I see the story of George Wallace as another great American tragedy. I don't think you can minimize the harm done while he was governor of Alabama in the 60s. Um, before that, uh, he ran for governor in 1958, having established a re reputation as a very moderate, fair-minded judge uh, when, when African Americans came before him in his court. Um, and there's a, in 1958, there's a TV ad that you can still see where Wallace looks at the camera and says, if I don't have what it takes to treat a man fair, regardless of the color of his skin, then I don't have what it takes to be the governor of your great state. And he lost in 1958 and said that he would never um, let that happen again. And so some people who covered him thought he made this Faustian bargain. And in the interest of his own political career and his own political power, he certainly taught the country, uh, taught politicians uh, how to appeal to division, how to exploit it instead of healing it. And I think we still see people, um, whether they know it or not, uh, employing those lessons uh, that he helped give the country in the 1960s. So I don't know what God thinks about that. Um, it's a complicated, complicated life, complicated legacy by a very talented man, which makes it um, even sadder to me. Yes. Yes. I don't think you can really talk about the 60s without talking about Woodstock. Right. We just... Sure. Um, yeah, and as a Woodstock alumni, I'm just interested in what you think uh, Woodstock, the impact of Woodstock, or what Woodstock really was about at that time, not necessarily what it's remembered for. 
Right. I do write about Woodstock in the book. I just hadn't mentioned it yet, so thank you um, for, for bringing it up. You know, one of the things about, um, about the 60s was that music was really important the whole decade. And the story of the music of the decade threads its way through the whole book from 1960 to 1969 when, when Woodstock happened. And in some ways, I think Woodstock was kind of a culmination of the, the power and importance of music. I think music was something that we leaned on to help us endure and maybe understand the times. Um, it was also a very, very much a countercultural event where uh, young people who were, uh, were many of them alienated and somewhat cynical about politics, uh, felt like they could still express themselves culturally and go and hear some of their favorite musicians in a bucolic place in New York State. Um, it was remarkably peaceful, uh, as, as you know, if you were there. Um, and one of the aspects of it that I write about was the very last song that was played at Woodstock where Jimi Hendrix played the Star Spangled Banner in a solo on his electric guitar. And Jimi Hendrix was one of the great, maybe the greatest uh, guitarist in the history of rock and roll. And he played this extraordinary thing that was the Star Spangled Banner. And people have written about that and speculated about what it was that he was doing. And some say that he was trying to evoke Vietnam as he, as, as, as he played the national anthem for, of, of this country. Um, he talked about it a little bit. He was on the Dick Cavett show. Uh, the 60s were the time of nighttime TV talk shows. Johnny Carson, Dick Cavett kind of popularized that form that's still with us today. Um, and Cavett was always a, a very uh, intelligent, very intellectual almost interviewer. And he asked Hendrix, why did you do such an unorthodox rendition of the Star Spangled Banner? And Hendrix said, I didn't think it was unorthodox. I thought it was beautiful. And so, you know, we're left to ponder uh, this counterculture icon um, closing this counterculture festival with the Star Spangled Banner. Um, and then we also, I guess, have to ponder the fact that in less than a year, uh, he was dead uh, from the effects of drugs, which became, you know, whatever else it was, it became a, uh, a, an act of, uh, an expression of hedonism that sometimes had deadly consequences. And so Hendrix reminds us of that also. So Woodstock, I try to think about in a very multi-layered way, I think, and everybody has their own sense of what it meant, but that's kind of the way I present it. We're going to do two more questions, one here and then one. Okay. Um, real quickly. Yes, back here, if you don't mind, back here first. Yes. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Right oh, there. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. I wondered, it appeared, and perhaps you do cover it in the book, um, you cover Kennedy, and then we get down to 1968, and you, you, you mentioned the quote by Robert Kennedy, and you wonder at the end how we will all come out. And... While I was doing it, I was thinking about Kennedy and about the end of the decade, because the same nation that, that, that goes through this period of turbulence and chaos ends up in 69, walking on the moon. Yes, and right. so I wondered in that context of the hard rain, how the nation comes, does come out at the end of the decade, actually with a man on the moon. Yeah, I think that's a really good question, and, um, and, I, and I, I do write about that because, uh, you know, President Kennedy sent us on this improbable journey that he announced in 1961, and uh, from what I've read, many of the, the engineers and scientists in Huntsville were kind of horrified, like, can we really do this, you know, and, and then we did it. Um, I write about going to the moon in, in, in two places in, in the book. One of them is in 1968, actually, on Christmas Eve, when Apollo 8 made it to the moon but didn't land. The lander wasn't ready, but the Apollo 8 circled the moon uh, 10 times. And when they did that and they came out from the dark side of the moon, they saw and took a picture of, for the rest of us, something that no human being had ever seen, and that was an Earthrise. 
And the picture Earthrise became sort of an iconic symbol of many things, but one was an environmental consciousness. The other was a, uh, just a, a, a reminder of how small and fragile our planet looked hanging against the blackness of space, and somehow it made all of our divisions and petty quarrels and so forth seem even more uh, absurd. And then the following summer, we did land people on the moon. I went back and was reading about that and was reading the front page of the New York Times about this mighty journey and, and one small step and all of those things and had forgotten, uh, many of you may remember it already, but this happened at the exact time that Senator Edward Kennedy drove a car off a bridge on Chappaquiddick Island and a young woman who had great uh, potential, 27 years old, Mary Jo Kopechny, died and drowned in the dark waters uh, of Chappaquiddick Island. I was just on Martha's Vineyard and uh, was in Edgartown, and, and it's so Chappaquiddick is right there. I mean, it feels like it's not any further away from then the end back of this auditorium. And, you know, the scene of this horrible tragedy. And so the front page of the New York Times is dominated by only these two stories and and there's something about that too that just was uh, uh, emblematic of the times you know and here was Edward Kennedy brother of the president who had sent us to the moon uh, who who had this moral lapse and left the scene of an accident um, and yet um, as the writers of the Boston Globe remind us in their book The Last Lion uh, this was one of, became, they thought, one of the motivating things that caused him to pull his life together and become one of the great bipartisan senators in the history of the U.S. Senate. Somebody who was respected by Republicans and Democrats alike as he pursued his very passionate liberal agenda. And so he continued with the remarkable, I think, example of one of the richest, most powerful families in America that that staked its political future on caring about those on the margins of America. Um, so all of those kind of things were left to ponder as as the decade ends. I think. Thanks for that question. One one over here and uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Uh, I guess I'm addressing a glimpse I had in Montgomery in the late fifties, early sixties. And that was student teaching in Montgomery and being asked to stay with a family, the children, while the mother attended a Jewish convention in perhaps New York, one of the places. One of the little girls came to me and she said, why am I not invited or asked to say a prayer at school? Oh, wow. Well. And that kind of made me think, what is it that is holding, who is it that's holding she of that particular faith back from presenting a prayer in school? And that was during the time that we had the prayers and national anthem and Pledge of Allegiance in school. Yeah. But certain people were not encouraged to. Yeah, and that was one of the reasons I think that the Supreme Court felt compelled during the decade of the 60s to address itself to the issue of state-sponsored prayer in school because if, if the school is an instrument of the, of the state, a public school, uh, told kids what to pray, then, you know, Jewish kids or others, uh, you know, would... would would feel like it wasn't meant for them or whatever. It was one of the, you know, I always uh, like the person who quipped that uh, anybody who's ever taken a final exam knows that you can't abolish prayer in schools. You know, you, um, you can only address yourself to who tells you what to pray or whatever. So anyway, last question here because you had yeah, your just hand Just a, a quick statement. Uh, yes. In a lot of minds, even today, our community in Montgomery does not hold a very positive image because of the period of time in the 60s that you addressed with Dr. King and George Wallace and the birthplace of civil rights uh, dissension and so forth. Uh, some years ago, uh, uh, the, the 
leaders of Dr. King's church next door here right. determined that they wanted to rebuild the church and add a Christian Ed building behind. And for some unknown reason, they approached me and asked me to lead that fund drive in the community. Great. And in doing so, of course, I called on the, the people who had the ability to give, who were predominantly white and people significantly older than me who had been mature during that period of time and lived right. here. And uh, I called on a lot of people, again, predominantly older whites. Every person I called on gave. Yeah. yeah. One degree or another. Yeah. And yeah. I think to the degree that that speaks for what Montgomery really is, uh, it was represented by their generosity. I think that's a really great point. And, uh, and I'm glad you made it. And, um, you know, I can't think of a city uh, that has done more than Montgomery, actually, to preserve that history and to make it accessible and to make it provocative, even if you look at the totality of the historic civil rights sites in this city. Uh, you, can't, you can't come here without uh, being made to think and being grateful for the courage that people displayed, many of them African American, but not all, uh, back during that time and the generosity, I think, that continues. You know, one of the striking things to me is looking at that church and how close it is to the Capitol. And you ponder that, uh, ponder the history that was made on that corner. Um, and it's an amazing thing, and that's Montgomery, you know. So thanks for that point. Thanks, everybody, for coming out.